Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Rural Non-Congregate Service Summer Food Service Program training for 2023. I'm Adrienne Ackroyd, the Summer Food Service Program Coordinator for Maine Department of Education, and I'm here today with my colleague, uh, Kate Phil, the Coordinator of the Summer Food Service Program. And we're happy to be with you today to talk about what non-congregate service looks like in rural Maine for 2023. Here's our agenda today. Um, so we're gonna start with a overview of 2023 Rural Non-Congregate Meal Service. We're gonna talk about the process of applying for non-congregate meals. We're gonna go over the monitoring requirements, the re reporting requirements, and then take some time for questions. So it's important to know the background of non-congregate meals. And in 2013 or 2023, excuse me, the Consolidated Appropriations Act took place, which established a permanent non-congregate meal service in the Summer Food Service Program. This option is for rural areas with no congregate meal service available. And it could be for the Summer Food Service Program or the Seamless Summer Option Operations. So you might be wondering, First things first, am I even eligible for non-congregate meals? So here's the general um, eligibility requirements and we're gonna go through this in more detail. So the first thing is you must be an approved Summer Food Service Program sponsor in good standing. Sites and service areas must be in rural areas. Sites are established where, not, where congregate service is unavailable. Open non-congregate sites must be area eligible either by school or census data. If the rural area is not area eligible, reimbursement can only be received for children who qualify for free or reduced priced meals. Rural meal delivery may be an option to consider in this case. So let's go through establishing eligibility. First things first, rural determination. Non-congregate service is for rural areas only. We must use approved data sources to determine rural status. The first step is taking a look at the USDA rural designation map. This map has been around for a while. It helps us determine whether you're rural or urban for reimbursement purposes. Um, but now it can also be used to establish rurality for non-congregate meals. If the area is not rural on the FNS rural designation map, does it mean that it's not eligible for non-congregate meal service? No, we are allowed to look for rural pockets and we'll go through what that looks like. So here's that US, USDA rural map and sites operating in the purple non-rural counties require further USDA approval for rural pocket status. And the counties in Maine that are currently considered non-rural are Sagadahawk, Androscoggin, York, Cumberland, and Penobscot. However, we know that there are rural pockets in these non-rural counties. And so with USDA approval, the following sources can be used by us to determine rural pockets. Our first go-to source is the NCES mapper and the green rural areas on the map, 41, 42, 43 are the codes are considered rural pockets. And with USDA approval, we can take a look at establishing rurality with those green rural areas. We're also able to look at rural urban commuting area codes four through 10, and here's a link to that information. <clears throat> and if uh, RUCA, which it's called, is one to three, not four to 10, we can then take a look at RUC codes four to nine, <laughs> rural urban continuum codes, um, or urban influence codes three through 12. So we'll be the ones that are checking for rural pockets and making that request from USDA. Um, taking a look at the maps and the options, we've determined that the best resource to use in the state of Maine is the NCES data that shows a lot of rurality in our state. So we're able to pick up rural pockets with that resource. But I do wanna flag that No Kid Hungry developed a mapping tool that looks for rural pockets as well. Um, from my understanding, it uses RUCA codes, RUC codes, and UIC codes. So it's not capturing that NCES data from my understanding. So we're gonna take a look at the NCES map in 2023 as we do believe that's the best resource to use to find rural areas. 
And so here's a screenshot of an example of the NCES map. And that little black dot in the green area is a proposed site in Kittery, Maine. Um, and based on the NCES map, it's considered rural fringe code 41. So we would be able to move forward and ask USDA to determine this as a rural pocket to consider non-congregate meal service. So everybody might be asking, well, I'm not rural. What about non-rural areas? Can non-congregate meals be provided in non-rural areas if program access is limited because of lack of transportation, safety concerns, lack of a location to serve meals, or other similar reasons? Unfortunately not. USDA has been pretty clear that non-congregate meal service is only allowed in rural areas where no congregate meal service is available. How should state agencies identify whether an area has no congregate meal service for the purpose of determining if non-congregate meal service is allowable? The state agency, so that's us, Maine Department of Education and Child Nutrition, must ensure that the area the site proposes to serve is not or will not be served by a congregate meal service. We must prevent overlap between meal services to reasonably ensure children are not receiving more than the maximum allowance of SFSP meals per day. And we must follow the priority system required by SFSP program regulations at 7 CFR 225.6 B5 when approving applicants proposing to serve children in the same area. So that's an established priority order. Um, and so our first priority for approvals are public or nonprofit private school food authorities. Sites must be located in an eligible area. So even though you're rural, you still have to look at that area eligibility in order to establish um, an open non-congregate meal site. So data from approved sources that indicate that 50% of the children or of the children in the site's area are eligible for free or reduced price meals can be used. You can use school or census data and eligibility determinations are good for five years. All newly established sites must use eligibility data from the current year. And residential and day camps cannot offer non-congregate meals. Individual eligibility for free or reduced price meals may be determined by using school data or a meal benefit application. So this um, is important to consider if you're trying to figure out how to provide non-congregate meals in non-area eligible locations that are considered rural. So even though you're not area eligible, so maybe you're in a rural area where your school data or your census tract data is not indicating you can operate the summer food service program, you can still receive reimbursement for those um, students, kids who qualify for free reduced price meal benefits in those non-area eligible locations. So only meals served to children eligible for free or reduced price School meals may be claimed for reimbursement for non-congregate meals, and sponsors can use the free and reduced application to determine individual eligibility. Non-SFA sponsors must have a memorandum of understanding with a school food authority to obtain student data if they're not using the free and reduced price meal benefit application. We at the state agency have the responsibility to deny sponsors that we determine are not financially and administratively capable of operating a non-congregate meal service, propose one or more service areas that are already sufficiently served through a congregate meal service, or propose one or more service areas that do not meet the requirements for non-congregate meal service. Um, however, you as a sponsor have the right to deny um, our denial. So this information on your right to appeal our decisions is on our summer food service program page at the bottom. I believe it's under policies and procedures and there you'll find a link to our appeal process if you um, are interested in appealing a denial for non-congregate operations. All right, so let's transition to talking about um, some rural non-congregate guidance. So this information was pulled from a series of Q&As that USDA released on rural non-congregate operations in the 2023 Summer Food Service Program. Can existing rural sites switch from congregate to non-congregate meal service? Yes. 
However, the non-congregate option is not intended to replace congregate meal service. Priority goes to those rural areas that the congregate summer food service program cannot reliably, reliably reach. May a non-congregate site operate in close proximity to a congregate site that is closed, enrolled, or a camp? Under some circumstances, yes. Um, but we at the state agency must ensure that the congregate and the non-congregate sites will not serve the same population of children for the same meal service on the same day. If sponsors offer non-congregate meal service in rural areas, are they still required to follow existing SFSP program requirements? Yes, all SFSP program requirements and other related regulations and instructions apply to both congregate and non-congregate meal service, unless other specif otherwise specified. Um, so the guidance here today um, is the most up-to-date guidance we've received from USDA and non-congregate operations, um, but you are still required to follow all other SFSP program requirements um, that are above and beyond this training. Combination sites are allowed, so a site can provide a combination of congregate and non-congregate meal services. There can be no overlap in service to children. Up to two meals or one meal and one snack per child per day is allowable. And you would work with our team on approval for non-congregate sites, including combination sites, to ensure that you're eligible and that you're meeting the service requirements. Okay, so let's go through some examples of what a congregate or combination site might look like. So let's start with A, a site that only offers breakfast through congregate service may be approved to provide a lunch through non-congregate meal service. For instance, a school enrichment program that only operates in the morning, breakfast is provided through congregate meals. The program ends at 10 a.m. Non-congregate lunch meals may be approved. Example B, a congregate site that serves lunch and breakfast three days a week may, not, may be approved to provide non-congregate meals for days with no congregate service, including weekends. For instance, a summer reading program offered Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is offered Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Congregate lunches can be made available Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and non-congregate meals can be provided for Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. Example C is a congregate site that operates in the month of July may be approved to provide non-congregate meals for the summer period following the last congregate meal service day, provided that the non-congregate days are included in the site's approved service period. For instance, the summer enrichment program at ABC School ends July 31st. Non-congregate service can begin in August if there, are no, is there, if there is no congregate site in August. Let's go through non-congregate meal service times. <clears throat> so even though you're able to serve breakfast and lunch together or meals together, you still have to establish meal service times for each non-congregate site. These requirements may be met through state agency approved pickup schedules or delivery plans with designated times for distribution. And Kate will be going through the application and where this information goes. Um, and we still have to approve any changes in meal service times. Sponsors offering a non-congregate meal service are not required to serve breakfast in the morning or allow one hour to elapse between the end of one meal service and the start of the next. But you still must have documented service times. Now we're going to go through some non-congregate service models to consider. The first is a meal pickup model. This provides packaged meals that are taken home for children to eat later. Sometimes it's called grab and go, curbside service, or take home backpacks, for instance. Meal pickup is available to all children when the pickup site is in an area eligible rural area or to children who are eligible for free or reduced priced meals when the pickup site is in a rural area that is not area eligible. Parent and guardian pickup is allowable, but you must have policies and procedures in place to ensure meals are for children only and that duplicate meals are not distributed. You can also operate a home delivery model with the non-congregate program. Summer Food Service Program sponsors can operate home delivery with our approval at the Department of Ed. 
Signed consent forms will be required from parents and guardians, and the consent form must indicate that the parent gives permission for home delivered meals, and it should collect information from the household, such as number of children, dietary needs, number of meals provided, um, just so you have that documentation that's a requirement of doing a home delivery program. We recommend having a recurring pre-order form, which is a good way to streamline the process and get that documentation. Um, and as always, food safety concerns must be considered and we'll go through those in more detail. You must establish eligibility for delivery routes for home delivery. All students within an eligible service area, so area eligible area, can receive home delivered meals and may be invited to participate. This is too important to consider when using census to determine eligibility because the delivery addresses must be within that census block. In non-area eligible rural locations, individual student eligibility must be established and reimbursement is only for those who qualify for free or reduced priced meals. I just wanna back up and say that um, in addition to census, uh, census information for eligibility, you can always use um, school data if it's over 50% free and reduced to establish eligibility in that area. Non-SFA sponsors can operate in non-area eligible rural locations um, with a memorandum of understanding with the applicable school food authority for data sharing purposes or by using the free and reduced price application to determine eligibility and non area eligible locations. Okay, let's go through some safety concerns to consider. So food safety is important for all meal service models. Sponsors should ensure food selections and packaging promote food safety. Sponsors should also include instructions on at home storage and preparation. As with congregate SFSP meal service, sponsors must ensure non-congregate meal packages meet state and local health and safety requirements. And we recommend utilizing food safety COVID-19 resources you've already developed as best practice. Sponsors providing non-congregate meal service in rural areas should prepare a food safety plan, then maybe an SOP, to ensure that meal service will be conducted safely. As a reminder, all food service staff must be trained on program operations, which include local health, food safety, and sanitation guidelines. And sponsors um, can visit the Institute of Child Nutrition's Food Safety for Summer Meals webpage. It's linked here. The, uh, this website has some additional resources related to food safety and summer meals. Main Bright Track also has a food safety section as well. All right, another non congregate service model. Um, is multi-day meal issuance. So this is multiple days of meals which are provided on one day, whether it's unitized or comprised of bulk items. An example, a sponsor may provide up to five meals, five days of meals every Monday. If this was unitized, it looked like five distinctly packaged units or sets of menu items. And if it was bulk, you must be able to, you, if it's bulk, you must be able to portion um, what's provided into specific quantities in line with the meal pattern requirements. And in the state of Maine, we're allowing up to five days of meals at a time for multi-day service. Let's talk a bit about bulk versus unitized. A bulk service model is specific food items provided in a larger quantity for a single meal service. An example is a loaf of bread and a package of deli meat in addition to other things to meet the meal pattern, of course. Um, meals should not require cooking, chopping, or any preparation requiring, requiring, requiring equipment or cooking skills. And you need to have a menu um, to show how you're meeting the meal pattern with a bulk meal model. That will be part of your documentation to show that you're meeting meal pattern guidelines um, for non-congregate meals. A unitized meal program is um, when the meal is individually portioned, packaged, and served as a unit. Beverages such as milk or juice may be packaged separately, but served with the meal. Some reminders for mobile sites. They may be congregate or non-congregate. You can work with DOE on the best model. Um, in the past, we've seen some really successful congregate mobile meal programs where 
um, meal delivery happens at set sites um, with an amount of time that the mobile delivery driver is there for congregate service. And so that's still allowable. And if you can operate a congregate program where kids could get together, where they're naturally um, playing in the summer and you can ser service them, we strongly encourage continuing that congregate model. Um, however, if you found that a non-congregate program would work best in your rural location, you can work with us on what's gonna best meet the needs of the community. Mobile delivery um, programs may stop at designated pickup locations. If you were using doing a pickup model, for instance, they were picking up meals at a local park or something like that, you would need to make sure that you had a separate site information sheet for those pickup locations because each stop would be its own site. However, if you're running a home delivered meal program, um, each delivery route that was established using eligibility, so area eligibility, um, would be its own site. So um, home delivered meal programs are typically um, their own site, and you can work with us to determine how many different sites you would need depending on the eligibility with that. Okay, offer versus serve is allowable for non-congregate meal service. All required components must be offered, and participants must have the ability to select a reimbursable meal, and food safety requirements must be followed. So something that um, I've been thinking about um, with multi-day meal service and offer versus serve and all these things is you just wanna keep in mind that you're offering customer service to children and you wanna make sure you're able to provide food in a safe way, but food that's appealing, appetizing for children. And if you're going to be serving up to five days of meals, food that's gonna hold, hold well by day five. So it's really important, um, not just with offer versus serve, but with all multi-day meal models that you're considering your menu um, and how many days of meals you're providing and the quality of those meals by the end of that time frame. All right, so I'm gonna jump in here. This is Kate to go over the application process for showing us your non-congregate meals. The steps for qualifying for non-congregate service is going to start with completing this online webinar. So as soon as you've watched this webinar, you've completed step one. Step two is to sign and upload the attestation for compliance with, non with rural non-congregate meal provision. This is a CMP web upload. I'm gonna be showing all these documents in a few slides to come. Uh, step three is to complete the Microsoft form for validation that the proposed site is in a rural location. So this is a Microsoft form, and then you'll get validation with an email from Adrian or I that this is a rural site. Step five is to complete the sponsor plan for non-congregate meals. This is another CMP web upload. And the last step is to update your site info sheets in CMP web. So the first um, thing on the list is the attestation of compliance. So again, this would be a signed agreement by this executive contact of your sponsor with the acknowledgement of the following. The non-congregate meals will only be claimed um, at the site that meets all of the state of Maine and USDA rural non-congregate SFSP meal requirements. The sponsoring organization has received training on rural non-congregate meals in SFSP. So that's this webinar. That's just stating that you've watched it. The sponsoring organization will only claim non-congregate meals at sites approved by the state agency and the sponsoring organization will report the required non-congregate meal data to the state agency upon request required by USDA. And Adrian will go over this a little bit later. So that's all parts of the attestation. And here's where you can find it in CNP Web under that checklist, under that checklist tab in your sponsor summary page. It's a PDF document that you're going to download and sign and then re-upload into CNP Web. And here's a screenshot just to give you an idea of what it looks like. The next um, item is that Microsoft form. So it's pretty simple. There's only six questions that you're gonna fill out on the, um, on the form. You're gonna complete 
one form for each site that you're proposing. And what we're doing with this information is really collecting the address to make sure that it is indeed in a rural area. So all sites um, need to go through this uh, Microsoft form to be approved as rural status. And then when um, it is approved, you'll see, receive an email from Adrian and I saying, you're good to go to the next step. Okay, the non-congregate plan, you're gonna submit one for each of your sites. Um, we understand, and you'll see in a minute, that there's only one download upload in CMP Web. If you have multiple sites that will need a plan, if you're tech savvy, um, you can cut and paste the document um, so that you've got more than one site on one document. If you struggle with this, you can always email me, um, but I'll go over this in just a second. So the non-congregate plan, what it entails, you're gonna complete one for each site. Um, it's going to more actu accurately capture which days and meals will be provided for your non-congregate service. And it's an acknowledgement that this particular site um, does not conflict or overlap with any of the other sites in the service area. So it's again, kind of, capturing that the idea is one meal per child per day, per day or one meal type per child per day. So the non-congregate plan, again, for each site is under number nine of the checklist tab. It's a um, just a regular Word document that you can click open and it has a series of questions. Um, here's what it looks like. So it, each of these questions is outlined for one site. So again, to do multiple sites on the same page, just cut and paste these questions and keep pasting below the document. When you're complete, you can upload it back into CMP Web. Okay, again, one plan per non-congregate site. Um, if you're doing multiple sites, you're gonna combine it all into one document. Okay, now the site info sheets are the last piece. Uh, if you are starting a brand new site that's non-congregate, you're gonna email me to add it to your sponsor application. If you're just updating a site info sheet that's already there to be non-congregate service, you're just gonna do these next two steps. For all site info sheets to be non-congregate, you're gonna go to number 10 on the site info sheet and you're gonna select that it's a mobile site regardless of whether or not it's a mobile site. But this, um, by selecting the mobile site, it allows you to run your mealtimes together. So that's why we have you select mobile. And then another piece to number 10, here, I'll give you a screenshot. There you go. Another part to number 10 is that other check. If you, collect, if you click other, write in non-congregate in that text box. So again, you're gonna click mobile and other to indicate that you're doing a non-congregate service at this site. And then you're gonna go down to number 20 and you're going to make sure that you're indicating the number of days in each month that you're providing meals for, not the number of days that you were actually physically serving meals. This is an edit check on your claim and you wanna make sure that this is accurate. So again, it's the number of days in the month that you are providing meals for. And then the same goes for the site times and the days of the week. You're going to select the days of the week you're providing meals for, not physically serving. And for the site times, um, you are allowed to serve breakfast and lunch at the same time if you have a rural non-congregate site but the site info sheets will not let you have the same times for both breakfast and lunch. So by clicking mobile, it allows you to run them together. So that's why in this example, you have breakfast ending at 10 and lunch starting at 10. So you wanna capture as best as you can the time of day you will be serving the meal or the meals, but it will not allow you to have breakfast and lunch have the same exact service time. So just try to be as accurate as you can, even though it's not 100%. So how do you know when you're approved? Well, you've done the following steps, and at the end of it all, Adrian and I will approve your application packet in CMP Web, the last step being the site information sheet. So we're gonna make sure that you have the appropriate uploads and that the site info sheets have been changed to reflect your status.
So now Adrian's going to go over some monitoring requirements. All right. So with rural non-congregate service, monitoring requirements are still in place, both at the sponsor level and the state agency level. So in terms of non-congregate monitoring, all existing summer food service program monitoring requirements exist. This includes a pre-operational visit, um, and all non-congregate sites are new sites in 2023 for monitoring purposes, so you will need to do those pre-op visits for non-congregate sites. And you have to do those site reviews, a two-week and a four-week site review for your non-congregate sites as well. And as a reminder, even though the racial and ethnic data form is not a monitoring form, it is still a required form. Um, and we often see this form completed with the site review. So I'm just mentioning it here to remind you that that would also need to be done. Child nutrition will monitor non-congregate services as part of our administrative review process of the Summer Food Service Program. So how should sponsors monitor meal delivery if you are operating a meal delivery model? So monitoring should include a review of the full service time. So the monitor should accompany the driver or follow um, if you can't accompany for the full delivery route, making sure um, that meals are being loaded properly into the vehicle, checking meal logs and delivery routes to make sure that they're correct. And you must ensure that eligible children are receiving the proper number of meals that meet all meal pattern and safety guidelines. As a reminder, civil rights requirements are in place for non-congregate service. The injustice for all poster is required for all sites, including non-congregate sites. And what this would look like is posting the non-congregate, or the, excuse me, uh, the injustice for all poster on your delivery vehicle. We've also gone over um, the need to report data. So let's review rural non-congregate reporting requirements. So we are going to be required to report to USDA the total number of congregate and non-congregate sponsors, sites, and meals. All non-congregate meals will be claimed at reimbursement rates for rural sites. Standard meal counting and reporting procedures apply to both congregate and non-congregate meal service. And data will be requested within 30 days of the end of the Summer Food Service Program claiming month. Um, and that's because we have to report the data to USDA within 60 days of the end of the SFSP claiming month. So um, we're still working out the details and what that's going to look like, but that's the estimated time frame that we're going to use. Sponsors must be able to maintain and report by month of operations. And so you need to make sure that you're having separate meal counts for non-congregate meals served by meal service. We will need to report the numbers of sponsors operating only non-congregate sites, sponsors operating both non-congregate and congregate sites, total sites serving non-congregate meals, total sites serving both non-congregate and, non and congregate meals, and total non-congregate meals by meal service. And all of this needs to be reported by month of operations. All right, so here is a high level recap of non congregate site considerations. Um, so, number one, must be in a rural area. Um, there is no flexibility with that. Um, we have a couple of resources that we can use to establish rurality, um, and we will help you with that process. Traditional eligibility requirements are in place for area eligibility. Um, however, if you are operating a rural, non-congregate service in an ineligible area, you are able to claim meals for students who qualify for free or reduced price meals. There can be no overlap with congregate sites. Meal times still need to be established and still need approval. You can have a hybrid model of congregate and non-congregate services. You can operate a mobile meal program. And with all of this, you want to make sure that you're ensuring that one meal type per child per day up to the SFSP maximum is in place. All right. Some of our uh, non-discrimination statements here. 
And at this point, we would like to thank you for joining us today. And we have some time for questions. So Paula, do we have any questions today? At this moment, we have one. Great. Bulk meals, can I send home on Monday meals for four days, then on Thursday send home meals for three days? Uh, yes, if you meet, met all the other eligibility requirements, you would be able to have two distribution days for multiple days of service, up to five days at a single distribution time if you met all the other requirements of non-congregate service. All right, what else? We know this is new. We know this is a lot. We know this is complicated. Um, so feel free to ask additional questions. Paula's waiting. Any dot, dot, dots as people are typing? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> All right. When you give me the go ahead. No. Okay. Well, Kate, Kate and I, um, are here for you if you have any specific questions. Um, I really see this as not being a um, cookie cutter program. Every sponsor is going to have an extremely unique situation that's going to require um, unique questions um, and support. And so that's part of the reason we, we established that non congregate meal plan that you're gonna be doing or service plan, that's really where you can showcase <laughs> what you're going to be doing um, with non congregate service, services for us to take a look at and make sure that you are operating in the way you're required to in order to get reimbursement for those meals. And you know, I'll just end on saying, um, for our rural parts of Maine, which there are many, um, but we, We've all heard about those rural areas in Maine that children are unable to get to summer food service program sites. And so um, I am thankful that we have, this is an opportunity to help children get access to meals in the summertime when they're not in school or don't have the ability to um, join congregate programs. So consider that um, when you're taking a look at this as an option and reach out to us if you need any support. And with that, I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you for joining.